Hello there and thank you for joining us uh, on this Instagram live regarding skin cancer. Um, my name is Blohine Moriarty, I'm a hospital based consultant dermatologist and I spent most of my time looking after people who either are worried they have or do have a skin cancer. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So the very first question that came in is a great place to start. What are the signs and symptoms of skin cancer? Well, the beauty of skin cancer is that for the most part, we can see it or we can feel it in our skin. And I'm gonna divide this question into two answers. First of all, are the brown, black melanoma cancers? And the second cohort are the usually pink or red other skin cancers. So I'm gonna start with the melanoma skin cancers. So do you have a new mole in your skin particularly if you're over the age of 35. So we know that two thirds of melanoma arise not from a pre-existing mole, but from previously normal skin. So a new mole should be brought to the attention of your GP. In existing moles, have they changed? So we all know the A, B, C, D, E criteria. Is the area large? Is the border irregular? Are there multiple colors? Is the diameter increasing? But the most important thing is, is the mold changing? Does it look like how it looked three months ago or six months ago? Um, and is it changing in an asymmetrical fashion? These are the key things to look out for in terms of melanoma skin cancer. There's a diverse range of other types of skin cancer, which are lesser known, but often just as deadly. The more common ones are basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, but there's a huge gamut of others such as Merkel, which can be also problematic. These cancers don't tend to present as moles or look like moles. In the case of squamous cell carcinoma, they may present with a new, tender, rapidly enlarging lump in your skin that increases week on week in size and that really will prompt you to seek attention from your doctor because they're so uncomfortable most of the time. By contrast, some of the other ca cancers present as just a little pink or red spot and they grow very slowly. And you may look back and think, gosh, that wasn't there six months ago. And anything new in your skin that isn't resolving should be brought to the attention of your GP. It may be something benign, but always important to check out, particularly if it's in a frequently sun exposed site. So what are the risk factors for skin cancer? In part, these relate to your genetics. So do you have fair skin? Do you freckle easily? Do you have light colored hair, light colored eyes? In that case, you are at increased risk of skin cancer naturally. The second part of that relates to your UV radiation exposure. Did you have sunburn as a child? Have you used sunbeds? R related to that is, do you work outdoors? Do you have a family history of skin cancer? Separately, a number of medical conditions and medications can increase your risk of skin cancer. So if you have been immunosuppressed for reasons such as organ transplantation, or you've had um, medications to reduce your immune surveillance, these can also increase your risk of skin cancer and these are the individuals who we worry about most. Can skin cancer be hereditary? Absolutely, like most things it can. It's slightly complicated however, so we know that if you have a first degree relative, so a parent, a sibling, a child with skin cancer, you're at higher than the baseline population risk of developing a skin cancer, but not that much higher. There are, however, certain genetic conditions that would also predispose you to developing multiple skin cancers. Mostly you'll know if these are in your family, but things to look out for are, do you have more than 100 moles and do they all look very different to each other? And are your family members the same? And in that context, have more than two or three family members had skin cancers? This is very unusual, but it does place you at a higher risk of skin cancer. Next question is a great question. For what reasons other than cancer can a mole change? Well, of course, the vast majority of changing moles that we see are not cancers. They're benign, normal maturation within a mole. So as children become adults and work into middle adulthood, moles become more pale and more raised. 
And as you go through life and you start hitting 70, 80, in fact, moons are much less likely to be darkly pigmented and often are quite pale and almost imperceptible in some cases. So this is a normal maturation process that moles go through throughout your lifetime. So not every changing mole is dangerous, but they probably should be checked all the same. An increasing question we get is relating to the use of artificial intelligence and apps for scanning skin. And this question, are apps useful in detecting skin cancer, is something that's been really well studied around the world at this point in time. It's challenging, we're not there yet, so I certainly would be very cautious in downloading apps and scanning your skin with them. Often the headline, mole, mole, you know, we will check your skin, is very different to the disclaimer, which will say not to be used as a medical device because it's not been validated. So I would currently exercise extreme caution in using apps for scanning your skin, although watch this space because this is a technology that is being studied extensively and will be developed into the future. So how often should I check my skin for changes? What I often tell patients is that if we have more than two or three moles and anything else to do with our time, it's impossible to remember what our skin looks like. So what's really useful is to have good photographs on your own mobile phone, if possible taken by someone else, of your back, the back of your legs, your limbs. And I would put a marker in your calendar and look, say, every three to six months and compare. Because it's very difficult to tell if something has changed. But I would compare, say, June, Christmas, Halloween, Easter. Do my moles look different to how they looked before? It doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong but it can be a very useful marker and can prompt review. And of course, early detection is the key to a good outcomes in skin cancer. The next question is one that's again, quite controversial at present. My skin is dark. What level of protection do I need to protect from skin cancer? Well, the first question is how dark and what are your background risks? So if you mean dark for, you know, a white person, then you need to take the same level of protection as if you were fair for a white person. If, however, your heritage is, is not of, of white skin, so you have black skin, there's no family history of skin cancer, and you're indoors, you've very little, you've very little UV exposure. In fact, the greater risk often in that population is of vitamin D deficiency. So if, there, if you have no, none of the risks that I've discussed, the jury really is out in terms of sun protection purely from a skin cancer risk. Uh, so we see cutaneous melanomas, so um, melanomas arising on the face, neck, thorax, abdomen, much less frequently in black or dark brown skin than we see in white skin. How is skin cancer most commonly treated? Well, it depends, like any cancer, on the stage. So the majority of skin cancers that we pick up are stage one. And for the most part, stage one cancer is treated with removal of the lesion and possibly surveillance. And that's, that's where treatment ends. However, as you get into the higher stage ones, so for example, stage one B melanoma, and then you start to get into stage twos and threes, etc., the treatment becomes much more complicated. So perhaps not just surgery at the local site, but you may need lymph gland surgery. You may need immune therapy. You less frequently need radiation therapy. And at that stage, that's the point where we're involving multiple members of our team, our oncologists, our radiation oncologists, our plastic surgeons, head and neck surgeons, um, ocular plastic surgeons. That where treatment becomes much more complicated. So our aim is to diagnose everybody at a pre-cancer or a stage one level where treatment is very straightforward with minor surgery. Ah, the sunbed question. So this question is, I'm in my late 30s and I used a sunbed in my early 20s. Do I need to be extra vigilant about skin cancer? Absolutely. Sadly, sunbeds are a significant risk factor for skin cancer. They were really in vogue for a while and this can be quite anxiety inducing because of course a lot of people use them particularly in the 80s and the 90s and none of us can change the UV radiation that we've had before. But the important thing is to A, not use them again, 
just as every other technology is becoming more efficient, so sunbed technology is becoming more efficient. Uh, and the wavelengths of light that are being delivered are often a lot, are very poorly controlled and can be quite dangerous. The second thing is, yes, I certainly, if you've used sunbeds in the past, would check your skin every three months. And if you've any other risk factors, would have a much lower threshold for seeking review from your GP and or dermatologist than if not. Is factor 30 sufficient for Irish weather or do I need factor 50? Well, if you're going to put on a sun cream, why not just put on the highest factor that you can get? So sun creams fall into two broad categories, physical and chemical. In reality, a lot of them are a mixture. The SPF, as written on the bottle, refers only to the UVB protection. So it's really important to have at least a factor 30 to protect you from UVB. But look at the rest of the packaging. Does it have a star rating for UVA? If your skin is darker, does it block visible light? So these are other things to look out for in your sun cream. In order to achieve a SPF 30 from an SPF 30, you need to use two grams per centimeter squared on your skin. That's about four times as much as the average person applies of sunscreen. So none of us really get the SPF from the bottle that we think we're getting. So for that reason, I would say to people, why not just use higher? But certainly at least a 30 is, is very useful. The next is a very interesting question. Can I develop skin cancers in parts of my body that have not been exposed to the sun? Well, yes. So 90% of skin cancer is UV radiation induced. So 90% of skin cancers occur in sites that were exposed to UV radiation, but 10% of them are not either because they're not a UV driven cancer, for example, primary skin lymphoma, or because there are other genetic factors at play. So we will see skin cancers on the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, um, underneath nails, and unfortunately even in developing in areas such as the perianal area, um, within the spine, um, at, inside your nose. So it is possible, and these are much less uh, easy to predict, and unfortunately much less easy to prevent. However, do be vigilant, do report unusual symptoms to your GP and even if we reduced our skin cancer rates by 90% wouldn't that be a phenomenal victory. So how can I tell the difference between age spots and skin cancer? Well the first myth to debunk is that unfortunately there's no such thing as an age spot. So what we think is an age spot is in fact a UV irradiation induced blemish if you like. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a skin cancer. Um, Really what we're looking for in this situation is a standout lesion. So do you have a single lesion that's totally different to anything else that you have in your body? That's not really a fail safe method. So if you have any doubt between having an age spot or a, or a skin cancer, I would definitely bring it to your GP's attention and they'll be able to direct you as to whether this is something that needs further investigation or can be left well alone. Thank you for joining me and I hope you gained some useful information for that. If in doubt, do seek the advice of your GP. There's plenty more information on the sunsmart.ie website, and these go through the five pillars of protecting your skin from sun. So don't forget to slip on clothing that covers your skin, long sleeves, tight weave, and um, put sunscreen on sun exposed areas, areas you can't cover. So back of the hands, you know, face, ears, and um, do wear a wide brimmed hat. So peak caps are great for your forehead, but not so great for your ears or the back of your neck. Seek shade, so you still get one third of the UV, radi UV radiation that you, in the shade as you do in the bright sunshine. Um, so you're not sitting in the dark, but it is very useful to sit in the shade. Uh, and do wear sunglasses because it's very difficult to get sun protection right in around your eyelids and of course for your retina. So a good pair of, um, of UV protective sun sunglasses will also reduce your skin cancer risk. So thanks for joining me and I hope that I've answered your questions satisfactorily.